Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Greetings. This is Hugh Ballou. Welcome to this version of the Nonprofit Exchange. We talk to leaders worldwide about their particular perspective of leadership, their expertise, and to share from their perspective, from their seat that, they, uh, that they've led from for so many years. My guest today is Will Willimon. It's Dr. Reverend Will Willimon, and we're sitting in, uh, in Durham, North Carolina, at the Duke Divinity School, where uh, Will will tell you a little bit about what he does here. But he and I got connected a number of years ago when he came to North Alabama and I was serving a Methodist church, and he came to North Alabama as a bishop. And we first got connected there. And I've been extremely impressed with his work, his writing, and we've interfaced a few times. And you've even spoken at one of my events and in, in sure. down the road in Greensboro. So welcome, welcome, thank you, welcome, dear. Will. I thank can you. say that to the nonprofit. Yes, yeah, thank you. It's it's like when we go somewhere and I say I'm Hugh Ballou, Will Willem, and people say, "What is that?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Too many rhyming things. But um, <laughs> tell us about yourself, your background, and why are you here at the Duke Divinity School? You know, I'm a Methodist preacher from South Carolina. And uh, as a young preacher, I was summoned uh, by Duke Divinity School, came up here, joined the faculty back in the 70s to teach worship. Uh, didn't like teaching full time. Uh, so I went back in the parish in South Carolina and uh, then went, uh, was again Duke, called me to the pulpit of uh, Duke Chapel, and I was there 20 years. Uh, it was sort of my first experience, uh, a ministry that large, a budget that large, uh, a staff that large. Uh, from there, I was elected a Methodist bishop. Uh, after being bishop for eight years, I was invited back to Duke. And uh, I now teach courses in, I teach some preaching classes, uh, uh, mission class, also though teach uh, leadership, ordained leadership, a class for the MDiv and for the Doctor of Ministry teaching leadership class. So in these latter years, I found myself really moving more into leadership, in fact, in my mind, I sort of think every class I teach here at Duke Divinity School is a leadership class because I think leadership, one of the things that's utterly necessary uh, for ordained uh, clergy uh, to be leaders, uh, but often that's something they say they don't get in Divinity School. And uh, often uh, it's always right at the top of a clergy list of skills they wish they had uh, more of. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so as people go into this meaningful work in ministry, first off, it's very difficult work. It's very challenging yeah. work. Um, let's go back a minute. We talked about leadership. I want you to define leadership, but I also want to ask you about what do you think from interviewing pastors that have been in churches for a while, what do they think they wish they had known before they started? So define leadership, and then mm -hmm. what do you think you're hearing from pe preachers that have been out there that they wish they have gotten from like this class you're teaching? You know, I hear pastors uh, complain uh, about administration. Uh, everything comes over, over, around that. Uh, that that consumes too much of their time. They don't enjoy doing it. They've had no training in how to administer well. Uh, I know that larger church pastors, whenever you're together, the, the talk always gets to staff, staff problems, problematic people on the staff, uh, hiring people, holding people accountable, all those things you gotta do in supervision I think few pastors come into the ministry saying, uh, God is calling me to administer a church. <laughs> and yet that is the work that you find yourself in. Another problem is I know when I 
went into ministry, my vision of myself was I'll be in a small, probably rural congregation in South Carolina. I hope I'll have a part-time secretary. That would be wonderful. But then you wake up one day and suddenly, like I did at Duke Chapel, uh, I had 30 human beings uh, that I was supposed to be supervising and orchestrating and coordinating and leading. And that, that was when I reached out and tried to get better leadership administrative skills. Probably should have reached out sooner. So I, so I hear about administration. And then I hear uh, a pastors complaining about conflicted congregations, uh, about congregations of, that don't seem to respect their authority and leadership. Uh, this whole complex of things that leaders, managers, administrators have to do. So uh, I, I hear a lot of that. Uh, you mentioned that you know being a pastoral leader is hard. Uh, I agree. Uh, however, there are times I think when pastors get together and complain, whine about administrative leadership difficulties, thinking um, this is this is what everybody faces who works with human beings uh, that have some task assigned to them, some mission that they're engaged in. And maybe the surprising thing is that there are pastors who are surprised this is the work, so. This is the work, it's with people. Um, years ago, I interviewed you for an article I was doing for Creator Magazine on the topic of conflict. And we were talking about particularly how pastors do or don't approach conflict. And one of the statements you had said that, that typically pastors want to go move away from conflict. Now, one of the people I interviewed on the podcast was a woman named Roberta Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert's a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. She was a colleague of Murray Bowen. I don't know if you are aware. I know Bowen theory, yeah. So yeah. I've been nine years, nine years studying. Yeah. With, and what Roberta, she was on this series of podcasts. And what she helped me realize is that we move toward conflict, remaining calm, stick to the facts. So instead of repelling, mm, moving, moving toward that. Yeah. So um, I found that, that Bowen Systems is a way to know self. And so it helped me um, to reframe mm -hmm. some of my leadership. <clears throat> but conflict is, is one of the things that, that exists <clears throat> in any human, human system like Bowen talks about. And part of what he helped, that theory helped me do is what he calls differentiation of self. What are our principles? And so that's, that's a really foundational piece for leadership is defining self. Agreed. <clears throat> and and um, uh, pastor's self-knowledge, I, I think, is a never-ending task. Uh, it, may, it may be complicated by the fact that for pastors, uh, we, we have lots of opportunities to be self-deceitful if we want to be. Mm. Uh, one, I think people aid us in our self-deceit as they say to us, uh, you're just so loving and caring and uh, we've never had a pastor like you and, you know, pushing all those buttons and, and then you start to believe that. Uh, there's a sort of halo effect. Of, I, I was in a church recently that has severe problems with decline, I think has severe problems with their staff being unable to step up to problems. One of the first things the pastor said is, uh, you know, we have a wonderful staff here. They just, I just feel so privileged to be working with them. And I'm thinking, uh, now from one angle, that sounds charitable and, and you seem to be a charitable person and you're thinking positive about these people. From another angle though, let's be honest, you don't want to do the work that would be required by being truthful. That you've hired some of the wrong people, you got to have some painful conversations, you need to make some moves. So rather than do that work, you're just going to say, oh, we, we, we have a wonderful staff and we're all Christians and we're all. So the, I, I love that self-knowledge. And, and in fact, uh, uh, for instance, in a leadership class I teach here at the Divinity School, uh, 
two thirds of the class always admits I have a problem with conflict. In fact, many in the class say one of the appeals for Christian ministry was I thought maybe I could do this without hurting people. Uh, in business, you have to fire people. You have to do, you have to, it said, I know it sounds ridiculous as you know the church. Uh, and, and I try to say, uh, I think it's very important to own that. Uh, I'd, I'd put on that list too with clergy. Uh, I think we clergy think of ourselves as powerless people. Mm -hmm. We look at our paycheck and say, we're really not, we don't have much influence and power. They'd be paying me more. Uh, we, uh, it's easy for us to say when there's a problem of a staff person on, in the church, we say, uh, this is for the personnel committee. Uh, they deal with this. I, I'm, I'm a pastor. I don't deal with that. Uh, I think that can be very dangerous. I know one of my jobs as a bishop was to discipline errant clergy who had moral lapses and invariably the image was, oh, I'm just a loving, caring pastor. I couldn't hurt anybody. Well, that's dangerous. And, and I, I think it's important for pastors to own their, who they are, the power they have, uh, use that power carefully. Uh, and so self-knowledge is a big deal. And, uh, Sometimes I've wondered, I, I don't know that the president of General Motors uh, has to know thyself, uh, as Socrates advised, uh, but pastors do, because mm -hmm. there are just so many opportunities for deceit, uh, uh, for uh, those moments when you say, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this for your own good and, and because I love you and um, you know, when, or uh, probably more typical is for pastors to say, uh, when I say, why didn't you tell the truth? Why didn't you uh, share the facts? And they say, oh, well, but because I'm such a loving, caring person, I, I didn't want to hurt this person. Uh, I, and so, so they, we have, Many resources we pastors for deceiving ourselves about our real motives. Uh, so, so along that channel, that channel um, I find that the really best leaders have an advisor, a confidential advisor, a coach, a, a mentor, somebody that helps yeah. them discover their blind spots because they're called blind spots for a good reason. Yeah, <laughs> and that would yeah. be one of them. To, you know, somebody is accountability yeah. partner. Yeah. And good advice. Uh, mm, I remember we had a consultant in Alabama and he educated us during a day of, about what it takes to revitalize a moribund, static, plateaued congregation. You got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. Have these discussions, these strategies. At the end of the day, he, at the bottom of the list, he put, he, he, his voice raised and he said, none of this can be done by yourself. You've got to get external assistance. You got to get a coach, an advisor, a mentor. Uh, you you got to get somebody who is not embedded with you. Uh, somebody who has no power in that configuration uh, well, I sure found that to be true in, in Alabama's bishop. I, I said, here I got a, the church has given me a job. I've had no training to do. Uh, and as you can see, very few gifts for, uh, I had 800 pastors, 600 churches. I mean, it was a leadership management nightmare. Uh, I got a guy, my first, uh, in, after a couple of months, I got a retired business executive. I asked, I said, Bill, what'd you make your last uh, year at the life insurance company? And he said, well, about 400,000. I said, well, I'm prepared to offer you $20,000 to work with me and uh, to be my coach, to be my advisor. Uh, um, and, and he said, oh, well, I don't like to. And I said, 
God wants you to do this. God has told me <laughs> to tell you to do this. And you wouldn't want to disappoint the Lord, would you? And he said, wow, you really do need an advisor if that's your attitude about things. Uh, it was wonderful. He had, he had an office near mine. Bill went with me to meetings, and he sat at the back of the room, usually, uh, took notes. And then we'd have an evaluation after the meeting. And he would say things to me like, well, once again, you talked about a third of the time you were talking and two thirds of the time they were talking. Uh, or he would say things to me like, um, you know, you're asking less questions than you did when I, we first started. Um, I think you've got to discipline yourself to ask more questions and make fewer declarative statements. Uh, your questions are not as good as they were in the early days. Uh, I, I'm afraid you're falling into the trap of thinking you know what's going on now. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> because that's a moving target. People are being deceptive and they don't even know they're being deceptive. So, so it was wonderful. And uh, the trouble with like being a bishop is it is really hard to find anybody who will tell you the truth. Uh, except generally your most severe critics whom you can't stand uh, because they're so critical. Uh, but uh, Bill was, was wonderful. And so now when any pastor says to me things like, oh, look at this church. And I tried this and it didn't work. And then the other night, so I, the other night we had this discussion and I, and I said, wait, wait, let me stop you right there. I know where I, I'm going with this. <laughs> it's, I'm going to recommend you get a coach, you get some help. Uh, so let me just stop you right there and, and talk about the help. Because I'm, I'm just not sure pastors can do much of anything without somebody coming in from the outside uh, and making the work as difficult as Jesus means it to be. And I mean, I, I use that phrase a lot that, you know, if, if, if the work assigned to us was simply to be a loving, caring group of people, and a lot of churches are a loving, caring group of people because that's all the pastor knows how to lead. Uh, that the pastor's uncomfortable around anybody in their 20s, so therefore the pastor ends up spending a lot of time with people my age. Okay, well, unfortunately, Jesus Christ, the work he's given us to do, the mission, um, is much more demanding than that. And so... There's going to be disagreements. There will be uh, crises, not simply because people are hard to work with, which they are, uh, but because Jesus Christ is hard to work with. Uh, he, he won't let us be the men's garden club. And so I, I keep trying and thinking about leadership, a bit asking the question, what difference does it make that we're Christian doing this? Uh, how is our leadership of a different quality than, say, leadership by a well-meaning humanist or, or something? So that, that's a hard question to answer, but nevertheless, I think it's important for clergy. It is. Um, and, and we don't really, it's, we take really sound leadership business principles and we learn from them when we put them in the church they're different because it, it is is in fact the church but there's yeah. things we can learn in my yeah. conversations with jim forbes when he was a pastor at riverside new york he said we need for our spiritual journey we need we need an experience 15 to 20 percent that's outside of our discipline and so talking about the coach Good. so we don't get stale yeah. and in yeah. a track that we get blind no, nothing else exists. This is mm -hmm. what I know. Mm -hmm. And part of why uh, Bishop Cho said to us at, at, at Blacksburg that the Methodist church was losing 1,200 members a week in America. It's, you know, we get on a track. We think this is how it ought to go, but it's not working. And, and we've set ourselves up for failure. And some of the 
the, the gaps in leadership. When I um, um, talked to Cal Turner, and I think he's talked mm -hmm. to the, the mm -hmm. council bishops, um, he went to his leadership team at Dollar General and said, I'm the son of the boss. I got this because I'm the son of the boss, is president and mm -hmm. chairman of the board. I, you have the skills. I've got the vision. So he claimed the vision, but he said, I want you to do this. Mm -hmm. And everybody stepped up. And Cal said, Hugh, leadership is about defining your gaps and finding really good people to fill them. And he also pointed mm -hmm. out that transparency is a good, you're not whining, but he was very straightforward because they know, Yeah. they know you don't know it. So why pretend? He said, if I didn't tell them, they would yeah. say, mm, I'm going to show him. Yeah. And so there's, there's this, this uh, vision thing. And when I, um, I worked with Dick Wills and when he was a bishop mm -hmm. in mid Tennessee, we're talking about the cabinet retreat when I was, I was leading it and I was talking about the vision for that. And he said, well, the cabinet's done going to make, it's not going to develop the vision. I didn't see anywhere in the Bible where God mm -hmm. gave a vision to a committee. It's it, here's the vision. Uh -huh. And so that's the vision piece. And I don't think the great commandment is your mission. That's a, that's a commandment. That's, mm -hmm. that's a commission. That's not a choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Paul Borden said that when you brought him in to talk yeah. to North Alabama, that's a choice. And that's not a choice. So what is it that, that God has called this church or this organization? We're talking about leadership in the church. There's some unique differences, but there's some global differences for anybody leading any organization. And a lot of what you're talking about, corporate mm -hmm. leaders have trouble with too. But, but talk about the pastor. Sometimes we err... There's back to Bowen systems. There's this uh, pseudo self and basic self. You know, we want to please people. So mm -hmm. we go in the pleaser mode, which is a downward spiral rather than going with our, our principles and making the right mm -hmm. decision for the right reason. Mm -hmm. So not pulling people in and saying, this is not how we do things. It's a pleaser personality. And mm -hmm. you did say to me in that interview a while back that, um, that in a, in addition to avoiding conflict, it gets worse as, as it goes on. And you also said that conflict is really the sign of energy in an organization. We don't ever eliminate mm -hmm. it. It's, we're, we're energetic yeah. people. So, so managing this and addressing it, we, we, I think we misunderstand words. And one word is we need to confront the, the, the conflict. And, and the root of it is with your front. It doesn't mean you hit them with mm -hmm. a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. So with your front means like in Bowen systems, approach it directly, calmly and openly mm -hmm. stating the facts. So there's a huge challenge I see in this area that you're talking about. Um, so, so how can pastors equip themselves besides having a good coach? And I suggest that it doesn't always have to be a clergy because you get. No, no. And yeah. It's good. And, and you, you can have coaches, uh, when pastors um, talk about difficulty of uh, uh, personnel difficulties and all, and I, I say, uh, because you're a graduate of Duke School, you've had zero training in how to hire people uh, or how to hold people accountable or how to have difficult conversations with people about their work and all. Uh, but I guarantee you've got people in your church that God has called to the ministry of personnel work. Um, draw on them, uh, uh, commission them uh, to do this with you. And uh, it, there's a kind of arrogance behind the pastor who says, well, I'm, I've got hands laid on my head, uh, so I'm good at preaching and administration and budgetary oversight. And <laughs> it, well, you know, I went to one meeting of the finance committee and uh, I was thinking, I, I always have disliked people like you uh, that uh, in high school were always talking about some really interesting math problem in the homework. Uh, I'm no good at math. That's one of the reasons that I went into the ministry and uh, to avoid that. So isn't it wonderful God has called you and uh, this is what you're good at and let me give you that authority to do that. So there are many, uh, I will, as, as you were talking, you, you talked about good business principles and are different in the church. Uh, that is so true. However, 
I don't want to let us clergy off the hook by saying uh, a, a frequent way of, it's either arrogance or, or evasiveness, but to say, well, no, wait, wait, remember now, the church is not a business. Uh, <laughs> and, and a lot of times that, that's just a cop out for saying, I am so arrogant, I'm not going to submit to instruction, I'm not going to learn. Uh, you were talking about conflict. You can get better uh, at managing conflict. There are certain things you could learn. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. You, you develop an attitude, which doesn't say, oh gosh, there's conflict, I've done something wrong. But to say, huh, there's some heat being generated here. I can feel it. Uh, maybe I'm doing something right. Uh, there have been moments in my ministry when I swear it's like Jesus says to me um, when I say, oh, what did I do wrong? I wonder what I could do. I swear, I, I hear Jesus say, gosh, isn't it a shame that I didn't have your personality and an MDF degree and then maybe I wouldn't have ended up like I did on the cross. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's, it's uh, and, and sometimes also management, good management leadership principles uh, can be overruled by the theological missional commitments of the church. Uh, I remember when I was wading into the immigration fight in Alabama, uh, taking on that little Jeff, Jeff session, um, the, uh, my management coach said, ah, really at this time, I just kind of hate to see you get into this. And I said, well, my clergy, the better clergy are asking me to get into this with them um, and all. And, and he said, hey, this is one of those moments when I realize that this is more than about good management coaching. Yeah. This is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you're going to do this because <laughs> I know you. And he said, this is where I realize I'm not ordained. I'm, I'm not clergy. You think at your best, you think like clergy. And, and he said, so I, I just want to say now, as you go into this, know that you're going to go miss some casualties and uh, you're going to take some hits and you're going to expend some of your capital. But it sounds like you think this is exactly kind of, so, so, um, I, part of being clergy is is applying theological and knowing uh, in the class I was just teaching, I had Douglas Campbell, who's our great Pauline scholar, New Testament scholar here. And he was talking about Paul's conflict at Corinth and all. And he was talking about Corinth served a multicultural, diverse church. And he said, and boy, it's all blowing up in his face in Corinth. And you got people with pagan values and pagan ethics. And then you've got Jewish Christians and you got Gentile Christians and they're fighting it out with each other uh, over who's a real Christian. And uh, a number of the pastors in the D-Men program say, yeah, oh, well, I've, I've been there. I am there, you know. Well, then Douglas said, uh, you know, maybe Paul would say, if you're in a placid, content, homogeneous church, you ain't much of a missionary, are you? You're not much of an evangelist. <laughs> he said, the testimony to how effective Paul was is the squabbles going on in Corinth, the conflict they're having. I thought that was a great way to put it. Uh, if you can say, you know, my church doesn't have any conflict over racial issues uh, or over political issues, uh, you better check out your evangelistic leadership because uh, Jesus Christ is about wider business than simply a happy club of older adults. So That's what separates us from being the social club, the country club. Absolutely. And... and we usually say, well, you know, what separates us? We have love, we have harmony. Yeah, but if that love and harmony is um, 
One, by our disobeying Christ's commission, it, it's wrong. I, I, you mentioned Paul Borden, and I loved him, kind of the, you know, church leadership on testosterone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I remember one of my pastors saying, uh, Paul was saying, you can't be captured by the older adults in your congregation. You, 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 you've got to be, uh, and uh, you, you've got to free yourself from that. And uh, you've got to ask yourself, every time you go to the hospital, every time you go to visit those shut-ins, who are you not visiting? Who are the conversations you're not having? Those good, well, one of the pastors said, Paul, don't you think that something to be said for honoring the sacrifices and the love of these dear people that, that built this church? And Paul said, no, the church doesn't exist to honor any human being. The church exists to honor Jesus Christ. And then Paul waxing to the thing, he says, uh, hey, some of you should have gone into nursing. There you can empty bedpans, do nice things for people. He said, this is better than that. You're, you're a preacher of the word of God. And uh, <laughs> I don't have a group receive that, but I was thinking, wow, you're, you're, it, it's good to be. And sometimes we have to be reminded, gee, God has called me for more even than an efficient, well-run organization. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to dismiss leadership management incompetence. But just saying, I think we pre for me, preaching was the thing that kept calling me back to say, you know, I am not simply aspiring to be a manager of an efficient volunteer organization. Uh, it, I'm a spokesperson for God. I'm, uh, I'm the one that says, okay, people, we're gathered again before the scriptures. Uh, how are we being challenged? So. Well, our, our duty and delight is to do meaningful work and to challenge people. I'm thinking yes. of Reinhold Niebuhr, com yeah. comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, quoting Reinhold Niebuhr reminds me of a book that I still love is that Leaves of a Notebook of a Tame Cynic. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but in there, uh, to me, is that something that has challenged me throughout my ministry where Niebuhr said, you know, when I, before I became a pastor, I thought there were so many boring and tame sermons because preachers were cowards and uh, these people are paying the salary and uh, they, uh, you gotta, you gotta be careful how you say things. But he said, now that I've become a pastor, I've realized that the source, and I'm paraphrasing, but the source of bad preaching is love. You start to love these people. You're with them. You get a front row seat on their misery. And the last thing you want to do in a sermon is make them more miserable. And so that's why there's so many boring and tame sermons. And he said, and that's why the prophets of Israel were all itinerants and they kept on the move. Uh, not sure Niebuhr was right in his characterization of the prophets of Israel and that, but I, 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 I found that so challenging that many of the really unfaithful things pastors do and lead, they blame it on love. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not telling this congregation the truth about their future. The fact that they have no future or very little future, because I love them. They have some of the sweetest people. Uh, so, well, I love that it complexifies leadership in Jesus' name, and it also says to me now, you know be honest here that you've noted that when you tell people painful truths, what do they do? They come back at you and they start telling you painful truths. Well, then where would we be? Well, we might be something on the way to being the body of Christ uh, where the church says, we're not only loving and caring and friendly, we're also truthful to a degree that you can't get without the Holy Spirit working in you. and We're not 
also truthful in how we, how we interpret the Bible. Uh, Paul Barden challenged the Great Commission is not your mission. That's, a, that's not a choice. It's a commission. Yeah. When I read word. Richard Rohr or John, Bishop John Spong, um, they, they talk about how we, we hijack scripture for our own purposes and as, we do. As, as leaders. So we misinterpret that. So that, that's a built-in liability. Um, you spoke about um, power earlier. And I want to I want to ask about that a minute. I find a lot of leaders are unaware of the power differential. Now, the pastor oh, yeah. is yeah. an influencer of power, whether they know it or not. And so we get in trouble uh, with relationships. We get in trouble with money. We get in trouble with authority mm -hmm. because we're not aware that that we have a position of power that goes with with what we do. In my, my church in Atlanta that I served, um, the session, which was the ruling body of the mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church, was 70 corporate executives who abdicated their authority to the pastor, which is not in the book of order. Yeah. You know, he's got one Amazing. vote. Yeah. The, the ruling elder and, yeah. and the teaching elder, they get equal votes. But they abdicated because he was the CEO. But it was that power position, huh. but they gave he's into together. it. They yeah. didn't know how to be the board. But he got things done. And as you know, he, mm -hmm. he died at 63 because he really wore out his body. Working, He worked hard and he grew that mm -hmm. church. And it was a great delight to, to know him. And I learned a lot. I do find that, that typically uh, clergy especially are unaware that they do have this position of power. And what they say yeah. has a lot more weight. So how does that get us in trouble? Yeah, I think that is, that it's, as I said, it's dangerous to not. It, it's also... Uh, so important to kind of own your power uh, and and use it responsibly. Uh, you know, we we ask we give policemen guns, but then we really expect them to be very very careful in using uh, the firearm. Well, I think like you know when I'm ordained and like in the United Methodist Church, the bishop says, uh, "Take thou authority to preach the word." Take thou authority to administer the sacraments. Uh, probably the bishop should have said, "Take thou, take care <laughs> with thou authority we're giving you." And um, yeah, it is, and and it it, it amazes me uh, that that illustration is is fascinating. I have been on boards of colleges and all, where you've got these powerful executive types on the board. But it's like they walk into a church meeting and they turn off their brains and they become these docile, smiling <laughs> people. And, and some of them will say, uh, well, you know, it's the church and, you know, it's not like a business and all. And I said, well, I think it should be more like a business. I said, uh, by the way, I guarantee your business for any of its uh, ethical failings uh, would never do anything this unethical that's going on right now sure. in the treatment of staff or, oh or whatever. Oh uh, come on, be an executive, uh, you, you use your power. And uh, I watched a, a little college just about go down the drain because of a board uh, sitting there saying, well, he is the president and he has his PhD. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I just have my BA degree, so what do I know? And, and tolerate behavior they would have never had tolerated in their bank or whatever. Um, again, but, but I, I agree, power, knowledge of power, uh, uh, clergy moral abuse. Uh, I remember the dean of medical school uh, one time told me, he said, the purpose of medical education, morally speaking, is to produce people who can be alone with naked people. <laughs> and not take advantage of them. Oh my. And I said, well now turn around, you see the divinity school? We do that in three years for a lot less money than you charge to do that. But I thought it was a great clergy around naked people a lot, vulnerable people a lot. Yes. And so to take advantage of that vulnerability, I think is a heinous act that requires removal <laughs> from ministry. We, we can never, you've, you've violated the whole thing. Uh, and then oftentimes when I've been involved in disciplining clergy, 
the self-image the clergy person has is me no i'm i'm just uh she said she was lonely and her marriage was unhappy and i'm and, and i'm in the business of loving and so i just tried to love and i said that is your explanation for what occurred on your desk uh-huh well that's horrible <laughs> and uh <laughs> goodbye uh, and it it uh so that is a big issue and and it is uh in the congregation it is uh important to, to, and i do think one of the things we got to we clergy have got to start being savvy about is power power inequalities power dynamics uh, who are the powerless people in the congregation who are not being heard and are not speaking up? Uh, and I remember a pastor kind of turning around the congregation who uh, a group came to him and said, we don't like this, we don't like this, that you're doing and all. And he said, every one of you is over 65. You represent 70% of this congregation and they said, we certainly do. Glad you've noticed that. And he said, I bet you reckon you represent 90% of the giving. And they said, we glad that you noticed that too. And he said, if this church is going to live another day, though, I've got to, I've got to ignore you as much as I can. Um, mm. I've just met with the pitifully six people we have in this congregation in their 20s. Here's what I've heard from them. Uh, we could lose those few six people. Uh, I, I won't, I have challenged them to in double their numbers this year. And I'll, uh, here's what they tell me we need to do. For the good of this church, I'm going to have to take my orders from them. And I hope you'll understand that. I hope you'll see that I, by my doing that, I'm giving this church another day. That that struck me as somebody uh, understanding power and saying, I got to discipline myself not to let you have the power that determines the mission of this church. That's not a typical decision, though. No, uh, I, I honored this pastor and say, oh, may your tribe increase. Uh, teach me how to do more of that. Uh, one other thing you said, I noticed as, as Bishop, one of the things my coach said to me was, um, you know, you've been an academic <laughs> and um, the way you guys think about stuff is with your mouth open and you say, hey, here's an interesting idea. Uh, let me just throw this out and I, well, I want to know how you feel about it and all. And he said, you can do that in your old job. You can't do that in your new job. In your new job, when you say to them, like you did in a meeting, hey, I'm thinking, why do we have district offices? I think you guys ought to be in your cars more than in your office. You ought to be out in the district. So why don't we do away with the district offices? <laughs> he said, it was breathtaking. Everybody there froze, said, you got a, you got a job now where you not only have, uh, you have power. You could actually do that if you wanted to. Um, so you've got to be a bit more careful about the stuff you throw out. Said if, if you want to shock them, if you want to steamroll them, you got the power to do it. But he said, I, I believe you'll end up paying a heavy price for that. Uh, well, it was a, a great, a, a great thing to say, Hey, you're, you're the Bishop. You could move them to Timbuktu if, if you're unhappy with them and uh, they know it. Uh, so leaders do that, not only in the church, but in other, other charities and are totally unaware of the consequences of those actions. Those decisions. That's a good word, the consequences. There are consequences and they're yeah. un, unaware of them. I want to, we'll close this interview out with yeah. a couple, I got two more yeah. questions. Okay. Uh, recently, there was an article in the Washington Post that said um, at its current trajectory, uh, mainland denominations have 23 Easter's left. So what does it... Mm. That's a pretty sobering thought, whether it's yeah. true or not. But what do leaders in, in mainline churches need to do to turn that trend around? Ooh, I got a long list, uh, <laughs> a bunch of stuff. Today, I would say, 
Uh, <laughs> one is we, we got to look at the painful, ugly stuff, uh, like that statistic. Uh, we got to stop lying. We, we got to find a way to tell difficult truths to people whom we love. Uh, again, I'm a preacher and that's kind of what I think I do every week is stand up and tell difficult truths from Jesus to people that I love, many of them. Uh, so we ought to be good at this. Uh, I, I think though we, in, in a sense, we ought to be made to stare at that and think, uh, I can't be this kind of leader that I thought I was trained to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastors would often say to me, this is not the same church that I signed on with. And uh, I tell you what, when I joined it, I, I wasn't, I didn't sign on for this. Well, that's what a dumb statement of a course. You know, we serve a living God for one thing and not of the dead. Uh, but also uh, every leader has got to constantly retool, constantly go back to school, constantly start over constantly ditch these principles that work great at my last job. They're inappropriate at this one. So uh, get used to it. I, I start my ordained leadership class by saying to them now, I'm going to try to share with you what I think I've learned. And a lot of it I learned the hard way. And uh, maybe it'll help you avoid some of the mistakes and all. And uh, you're going to get tired of the pontificating and the stories about Alabama and everything. But I, you need to use that. You, 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 you take that in. But about 50% of that is going to be wrong. Uh, uh, you can't serve the same church I served. And you can't do what I did. Uh, and there, there are people in here in their 20s who don't know a lot about ministry, but you kind of know more than I do about the future. Uh, so that's your job in this class. And you take in what I got and you sort through it, but you also keep your eyes on the future, the things that, that I, and I said, uh, the, the Lord is taking me out of this game. Uh, and, uh, but he's sending you in. And, and so step up and take responsibility. Uh, well, that, those, that's the kind of move I think we got to make. Uh, and, we will not have a future in mainline Protestantism unless we can do that. I must say I'm more impressed by local pastors of a lot of way places um, that are finding a way to lead into the future. I'm kind of more impressed than I am about like seminaries and, and all. Hey there, it's Hugh Ballou. Wasn't that a great interview with Dr. William Willimon? Um, we lost the last few seconds when I said thank you and goodbye because of a technical glitch, but you got all that great content. This session was sponsored by the United Methodist Cyber Campus, umcybercampus.com. That's C-Y-B-E-R campus.com. Go there and find the amazing programs. And if you're United Methodist clergy, it will qualify you for continuing education credit like the program that Center Vision has on there. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Please share it with your contact list. Have a great one.